Welcome back. Uh, we're going to start soon. Um, the next talk is going to be by Michael uh, Allison on, um, called Bounded by Belief, the Evolution and Function of Ideology and Individual and Distributed Cognition. Let's welcome Mike. Okay. Mike, you can take it away. All right. So, yeah, my presentation, as you said, is called Bounded by Belief, um, the Evolution and Function of Ideology in Individual and Distributed Cognition. Um, today, we probably won't get it too into the evolution uh, part of the paper, um, but I will do a little bit of background to kind of introduce uh, that. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, what is ideology? Um, so what I'm moving forward with here is uh, a rigid belief system um, that is it's unaccommodating to new belief systems. Now, sometimes this can be based off of a doctrine. Um, this happens in uh, religious ideologies where uh, a religious doctrine is interpreted in a certain way um, and taken to be rigid and, and, and not flexible. Um, and then I've, I've also written in mimetic activation. And what I mean by this, I mean, doctrine is still being spread through like mimetics in terms of like Richard Dawkins mimetic uh, spread. But when I say mimetic activation, I think it's kind of more organically uh, popping up in the internet, um, social media, uh, something like, I think QAnon is a good example of this coming to light out of 4chan. Um, so these are things that are not necessarily coordinated from the, the get-go, but kind of organically grow into these uh, dangerous ideologies sometimes, um, which obviously brings me to the next question of why should we be concerned about ideology? Um, so I think it's fresh in our minds of, uh, of last month's activities is something that I, is driven by one of these ideologies through mimetic activation. Um, and there just seems to be growing polarization in our world. Um, so what I'm hoping to do here is describe uh, what I think is contributing to the, the rise of ideology and why it's um, persistent in individuals and why it is maladaptive to distributed cognition. Um, so first, I'm just going to start with a distinction here uh, made by James Kars. Um, in his book, The Religious Case Against Belief, um, he, uh, he made a distinction between religion and belief. So um, essentially, he attributed religion as knowledge. Um, and, and what this meant was something that was open, um, something that evoked wonder um, in people. Uh, and in that sense, it was accommodating to new information, whereas belief is rigid and devotional. You devote yourself to it. You devote yourself to a system of beliefs. Um, this, this creates a kind of willful ignorance, whereas knowledge is a higher ignorance. Um, you are open to what you don't know. Um, and so something that I see as kind of contributing to the way ideology is manifesting uh, in recent years um, is something that Charles Taylor called the culture of authenticity. Um, so briefly, I would say that this is something that's been happening over the last few hundred years from Protestant Reformation through the scientific revolution. Um, kind of atomism of individuals. Um, so what I see in this contributing to ideology is this focus on the self or the focus on a small group. And so with that focus on a small group, I would, I would call that pseudo collectivism because it doesn't, the group is not functioning as to serve the greater distributed cognition. Um, and by distributed cognition, this could be province-wide, uh, countrywide, worldwide, especially in a digital age where we're very connected to other people. Um, so having that kind of openness and uh, 
connection to people and and not just serving the self, the unique self, which is what authenticity kind of is. Now, Taylor didn't condemn this. He, he didn't say that this was um, a bad thing necessarily. It was kind of focusing on personal responsibility, but it can degrade into these other forms. Um, and so importantly, I think this is a good way to think about um, how ideology functions in the world. Um, and so for problem formulation, um, not all problems are the same. Uh, here we have the famous nine dot problem um, where most people when first encountering the problem maladaptively frame it as a connect the dots problem, then it becomes an unsolvable problem or a very difficult problem to solve. Um, whereas their, their framing was never explicitly stated, um, it automatically happens, um, where we're looking for something like this as a solution, which goes against the, the usual um, framing of the problem. So ideology functions as that maladaptive framing. We, if we have a system of beliefs that's unaccommodating to other things, when we come into contact with new novel problems, we, we, we automatically frame it as this problem uh, that we know how to solve when in fact it's going to contribute to not solving that problem. Um, and so this is a bad cycle to get caught up in, um, especially since, so society is complex. So this means that we, we do need to outsource some of our information to other systems of, of, of skill. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say systems of belief here because, so what, what I mean by this is that like, you know, we, we hire electricians, we hire plumbers, we, we, we don't know all that there is to know, obviously. Um, but it seems, so the, the illusion of explanatory depth is something that Keel and Rosenblatt uh, showed in an, an experiment they did where they they got people to describe in as much detail as possible everyday items um, like a zipper. So first they got them to rate their understanding of the zipper. Then they got them to describe it in, in as much detail as possible. And then people came around and realized they didn't know as much as they thought they knew about these everyday items. So this is called the illusion of explanatory depth. And so what I think this, what happens here is that we, we fail to see how much that we don't know. Um, and this is something that ideology promotes. Um, so ideology promotes a bravado and certainty rather than being humble in the face of all that we don't know. And so in these complex systems um, of distributed cognition, we really need that, that humbleness so that we can operate in a way that is, is, is not rigid and is accommodating to new information. Um, and so at the individual level, I think what happens here is that we can get kind of addicted to ideology. Uh, it serves a purpose for a lot of people where they, uh, uh, you know, there's, it's serving a social function for that person. And it's hard to give that up uh, the same way that, you know, alcohol or drugs might uh, quell someone's anxiety. Belonging to an in-group might quell that anxiety and giving up those rigid beliefs uh, would be something that would be very unpleasant. Um, <clears throat> so this, his, Lewis's, oh, sorry. Lewis's model, uh, his learning model of addiction, which I think helps us explain this um, since it, his model of addiction doesn't really state that it has to be the uh, intake of substances that leads to the addiction. So this can explain a behavioral addiction such as one to ideology. So delay discounting, downplaying future rewards to focus on immediate, immediate ones. So we actually have striatal dopamine that upregulates these kind of behaviors. So we, we focus on immediate goals and the peripheral goals just get pushed to the side. Um, in ideology, this could be kind of dropping out of other social groups to focus on one. Um, and this creates motiv motivational amplification. So this hyper-focus on the reward. The reward also doesn't last very long. Let's say it's just like getting feedback from the in-group. Um, 
So if, if these are short-lived rewards, this is going to create compulsive behavior and, and kind of reinforce those patterns in the brain. Um, and uh, this is also tied to personality development. So people are tied to their beliefs, uh, and that kind of can make up a lot of who they are. Uh, so to take that away is, is very devastating. And then the issue of reciprocal narrowing. So as the drinker has a drink to call his anxiety, uh, that changes his world around him, um, creating more anxiety. It narrows his world. He has another drink that narrows its, his world. This keeps going on. And I feel like this can apply to ideology as well. If people are leaving other social groups, if they are being captured by ideologies, um, they are narrowing their worldview. <clears throat> so uh, that interacts with a breakdown of distributed cognition in the form of a loss of coherence in the information ecology. So in the age of the internet, we have information coming from all corners. So our fragmented narratives lead to this loss of cohesion. Um, something uh, Jordan Hall talks about, which he calls the blue church of the 20th century, um, was essentially, you know, there was two or three news networks that spread the same kind of narrative. And so everyone kind of knew what good public opinion was. Um, now, that wasn't necessarily a good thing in itself, but it had coherence in like a wide coherence. Um, so with the internet, which is great that we have more access to information, more people can distribute information, but this also comes with more responsibility and a lot higher uh, chance of manipulation through misinformation, uh, falling into us versus them narratives, uh, and less coherence equals less cooperation. Um, so from this problem, I want to propose a model for how adaptive distributed cognition might, might operate. <clears throat> so I'm going to take a couple of slides here to describe the component parts of the model, and then I will synthesize them. So self-organizing criticality, this is a process um, where uh, it, it's easy to describe with the sand pile example. So a sand pile builds up to a certain critical point, it collapses, the base then becomes wider and is able to restructure into a taller structure. Um, so it's been argued that this process happens in the brain through asynchronous and synchronous firing, uh, going back and forth, these neural avalanches that kind of allow restructuring in the brain. Um, and so in my model, this will be something that will become clear later that helps to restructure the network of distributed cognition. Um, and so this second component part uh, of, of this will be a small world network. Uh, as you can see here, between these three networks, uh, the small world network is the most uh, efficient trade-off between these two. So when you have a random network, you have high efficiency with low resiliency because of the, the disconnect between these networks. If we lose a connection, uh, we, we lose that efficient signal. Uh, the regular network is composed of mostly local uh, connections, so it's, it's very reliable, uh, but it is not efficient. So small world is kind of meets in the middle of that um, and, and we're able to have uh, the best trade-off between efficiency and resiliency. Um, and then, so a virtual engine is a self-organizing feedback loop. Uh, what I'm gonna propose here is that self-organizing criticality and small world networks plug in and form a virtual engine of distributed cognition. Um, so, the idea behind a virtual engine is that you have a, a virtual governor that is the selective constraints that kind of uh, limit the options for the system. And then we have the variation that is introduced through the enabling constraints. And this kind of, this opens up the system to new possibilities. Um, Verveke has argued that this is a process by which 
uh, our interactional cognitive fittedness is shaped to the environment. So this, this shaping of the sensory motor loop is, is how he describes it. Um, so using that uh, logic, I'm going to try to apply that to how an adaptive system of distributed cognition might be formed in order to give us the ability to respond to ill-defined problems um, so that we can shape ourselves to novel situations. And it might be clear at this point that something like ideology does not give us that freedom and it does not build us into the functional network that we need. So here is the model synthesizing this. So this is the adaptive virtual engine. Um, excuse me. So we have self-organizing criticality here, uh, the integration and differentiation function. Now, I like to describe this in real world terms as functioning in a system such as politics. Um, granted, it's kind of a naive uh, reductionist view of politics, but let's say that left-right politics worked in this way where there was a kind of building of a structure by the by like a conservative government that is then opened up to variation and, and the system is able to restructure through the integration of more liberal uh, progressive ideas. Um, obviously, politics operates in a much more ideological way than, than that, but in a perfect world, there would be this opponent processing model where uh, this, this actually functioned like this, um, which I don't think is something that we you know, I think that we can organize uh, communities and, uh, and different groups in this fashion. Um, and so what happens here is that that kind of healthy uh, process puts out this synthesis output. This is the output into the network of distributed cognition. So here, the network is a network made up of small world networks. So each node in the network is itself a small world network. And so this can be thought of as local level groups that are functioning in a way that is open and dynamic to other groups. Um, essentially, the, the logistical normativity of this function would be to solve problems in distributed cognition without causing other problems in the system somewhere else um, to, to the best of our ability. Um, <clears throat> so this is what it looks like when we're adaptively shaping the, I guess you could say the cognitive interactional fittedness of distributed cognition. Um, whereas something like ideology in the system would lead to something like this, where we have this organization that is failing. So as the example I used before with left, right politics, much more in the way that it actually functions in the world, there's failed processing and there's this collapse without rebuild. So there's no real progress being made. And this puts out a divisive uh, output into the, to the, to the, to the network. Um, I'm noticing here that there's arrows on the, the arrow coming from collapse without rebuild. It should just be, the divisive output should just be feeding into the random network and then feeding back in a circular manner. Um, so this would create a feedback loop where you are solving problems in the network by causing other problems in other parts of the network. So this creates this, this random network that is not, uh, that is not uh, resilient and, and ends up kind of in a state of collapse. Um, so that is my presentation. Um, I can leave up this if anybody has any questions. I wanted to also add that I believe later on today, uh, Emery Alka is gonna be presenting on shared agency, um, which I thought was a really cool idea for how you might organize these, these local level groups. Um, so I feel like that's a, a great fit. I recommend checking out that talk. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my talk. I hope, I hope my time was good. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Uh, we just have one question. It's from Jeremy. Um, he asks, it seems that you're proposing that ideology is uh, addictive partly due to its meaning making property. How do you think it might differ from a system like religion? How it would differ. So using the, using uh, 
James Carson's distinction between religion and ideology is that religion is like is open to uh, moving within the social context. So there's it's an adaptive kind of system. Um, Stephen Batchelor also talks about this in he talks about non-denominational Buddhism so that it doesn't tie it to any specific metaphysics or to any specific <clears throat> cultural era. Um, so yeah, the, the, having an adaptive system would be what under Carse's definition is what religion would be, whereas ideology is taking sections of religious doctrine, interpreting in, them in rigid ways, um, and just being unchanging in, in the face of new information. Um, Great. <laughs> Ariel asks, um, She's interested in, you said the important role of humility at the start of your presentation. My conventional understanding of humility is couched in individual character traits. Are you suggesting that hum humility is a byproduct of the global distributed model of cognition that you have put forth? Or would you say that individuals still need to focus on cultivating humility on an individual level? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. I mean, this is like a very high, higher level um, look at distributed cognition. So in order to have this system function as I've presented, there needs to be a lot of like groundwork at the local level. Um, so this starts with individuals. Uh, this starts with individuals uh, getting in contact with groups that have these same kind of values that want to create uh, these kind of uh, nodes in the network. Um, and so practices of humility would be super important to that. So yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's um, that it's, it's built in, but it's without it, we don't have that functional system. So I, I hope that, I hope that answered that. All right. Um, JC asks, uh, given the metaphors you're using networks, et cetera, how should we encourage flexible belief? Hmm. That's something I, uh, I mean, it's hard, right? Because if someone is captured by ideological uh, thinking, they're very unopen to thinking that they are even in ideological thinking. I mean, nobody says that they're in an ideology uh, or caught up in a cult. You know, people don't don't relate that way. Um, so it's it's something to encourage, I guess, when you see someone who's struggling, um, something I've recently been thinking about and I've heard other people bring up is if you look at a group like QAnon, um, you know, one of the grand narratives of that group was that there was going to be this grand reckoning at the end of this presidential term, right? Um, that that didn't happen. Uh, the, this the, These kind of made up narratives didn't come to light and so a lot of people a lot of people's worldviews were kind of crushed by that so I think even in the face of people that have some messed up worldviews that we need to encourage them um, to to kind of like welcome them into making sense of the world again so in that sense it's like I guess being sensitive to when someone's kind of worldview falls apart um, and being open to encourage them instead of just saying, like, just condemning them. Now, that doesn't go so far to say is, like, not punishing somebody for hateful or violent crimes. But if it's, you know, somebody in your family who might, or somebody near you that might have some of these ideas, I think that is how um, we can try to encourage flexible belief and show them that, the world is this dynamic moving thing. So if we just create these static narratives, that it's not going to, it's not going to help us. All right. Um, Sophia asks, uh, to what extent do you think that your ideal adaptive system is possible? What would the necessary conditions be? Yeah. So, I mean, I wrote in my description of the talk that like naively, I think that this could be something that, but uh, the, I guess the, the thing is, is the focus needs to be on the local networks. And this is something that I'm going to be working on soon. I'm working on a paper that will be directed at how we can have these local level groups function uh, more adaptively. Um, and like I said, uh, Emery's talk on 
uh, on this shared flow and we agency that kind of like brings people in this, this shared flow state. I think practices like that are, are something that are uh, conducive to, to this. So I think it's, I mean, I think it's, it's naive to think that we're going to organize the entire world into this distributed cognition model. It's more of an aiming point. This is something to base off, base your local um, community involvement on so that we can function in this, in this way instead of having rigid beliefs. Uh, because there can be ideologies that, that you know, are based on good values um, that kind of degrade into these rigid unaccommodating systems. So I think if we can recognize that at local levels that we have a, at least a chance of like maybe doing this in a way that maybe it infiltrates like government systems at some point, maybe there's corporate training that is like more revolving around like human contact and like not kind of like these rivalrous dynamics of capitalism and that sort of thing. So yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a tall order, certainly, but I think something that we can aspire to. Um, Nick asks, yeah. uh, could you give some general examples of what synthesis output or divisive inputs would be in the context of ideology? Yeah, so just using my the political uh, example again, I think, you know, like if left-right politics are functioning in the way they should be, there, they, there can be this healthy balance where, say, a conservative government is cutting spending and being responsible in that way. But a liberal government comes in and kind of says, no, like we need to support these social programs. Um, and there's this balance that's achieved where instead of the conservative government shutting down that wholesale and saying, no, it's like, okay, well, let's operate within some of these constraints, but like, let's get these things done. That then kind of puts this output into the community where there's like, there's a sense of cooperation coming from the systems that, that help organize this. Whereas if you are in a society where uh, a conservative government comes into office, and undoes everything that a liberal government did and then you're just in this cycle of like uh, of garbage um, then it just feels like you're fight you're constantly fighting in the system to to get things done so this is the divisive output okay and the final question from jeremy um you've been proposing a distributed cognition interpretation of ideology as we know individuals influences on ideology varies. What factors do you think uh, exist that's causing this? <clears throat> well, I mean, I think, I think John Verveke might point to the meaning crisis uh, as, as something that is, is driving this, um, which I would agree with, is that we are in this place where people are um, continually fragmented um, and, and not feeling like they're part of which kind of stems from what I talked about earlier with the like the blue church narrative of the 20th century with having this like kind of cohesion, whereas now uh, that kind of facade, that charade is over and we're not, so that kind of creates this like disruption of our worldview. Um, and there's, there's half truths and mistruths coming from all corners. Uh, people feel like they're, they're being lied to. People feel like they can't trust in the systems. Um, and so this might lead them into these rabbit holes where these like mimetic activations uh, might be taking place. And again, so like in the addictive model where this is filling a social role for that person, um, that, that can be invaluable to them. That, that, that's something that is on offer. So that needs to be on offer from healthier communities. Um, I, I hope that answered the question. Uh, I think there is there's certainly tons of individual differences. There could be people that are more prone to addictive behaviors, um, <clears throat> more people who are prone to uh, depression uh, or, you know, family dynamics that push them towards uh, these ideologies. <clears throat> All right. Uh, actually, yeah, there's one more by Sophia. She says, uh, would you consider moral values, uh, example, being against child slavery, to be ideologies that could possibly increase division? 
Um, strangely, yes. I mean, because I think like what um, I'd kind of briefly mentioned before, but like you can have systems that are based on good values, like wanting to, yeah, decrease child slavery. Um, but if you're doing that in a way that is only rigid and, and not accommodating to other systems, it's possible that even such a, a like a high moral value could degrade into just fighting for your belief. Um, and I, I feel like this this does happen where people are caught up in a cause, um, and, and especially when they wholeheartedly believe that this is a this is a system that represents being a good person, and they kind of tied their sense of morality of being a good person to it. If anybody is combating that kind of sense, then they, they're going to become combative too. So there's this oppositional nature that's built into ideology. Um, and, and that's really where the trouble comes is, is that it, it creates this opposition. Okay. I think that's all the questions for now. Uh, thanks for a wonderful talk, Michael. Uh, can we get like a round of applause in the chat? Like a little clap, clap. Um, Great. Thank you, everyone. And then, uh, so I think now we're going to go on to the lunch break. So we'll be back.